My name is Sherry Guess, and this is the Heavily Meddled Podcast. On this podcast, I interview patients, medical professionals, and industry insiders, having important discussions regarding the all too commonly experienced but lesser identified symptoms of hypersensitivity to metals contained in implanted medical and dental hardware, diet, and environments. These metals often cause a variety of dysfunctional immune responses, chronic pain, and other syndromes that fly under the radar of most patients and physicians. During these interviews, the patients and I discuss ideas for managing symptoms, share personal lifestyle modifications, and talk about how to advocate with and educate providers pre- and post-surgery, along with options found for implant removal and the how-to of adverse event reporting. This podcast does not give medical advice. From time to time, I may interview medical professionals that render personal opinions you can use to follow up with your individual provider. Let's roll. Hello, metalheads, and welcome to the jungle. Welcome back to this edition of the Heavily Metal Podcast. Super excited that you're here today with us. We have Jifa Dordunu from Victoria, British Columbia, joining us today. She is a nurse educator and super excited to have you with us, Jifa. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I'm excited to be here. I'm going to introduce you to Jifa. She is a rock star and I'm going to never remember her entire bio. So I'm going to read this for you and you are going to be so impressed with the awesomeness that Jifa is. And we're so lucky to have her here. So she is a PhD and an RN. She is a native of, oh, Jifa, I'm never going to get this right. Tell me the town you're from. I am originally from a village called Zuza. It was a village, Zuza. it's now a town. Okay, very good. So Zuza, right, is in Ghana. Yeah, pretty she, impressive. <laughs> whoo, I love foreign dialects. That's awesome. She is a associate professor at the University of Victoria School of Nursing. And as a clinician, Jifa has over 20 years of varied clinical practice experience working in general medicine and coronary care units, as well as outpatient clinics, focusing on heart failure and sickle cell. Dr. Dordunu has spent the past decade as a nurse educator. She began her teaching career in 2011 as a clinical instructor at John Hopkins School of Nursing. She later taught at the University of Maryland School of Nursing before joining the University of Victoria School of Nursing in 2017. She teaches a variety of courses at the undergraduate and graduate level, particularly courses in cardiac surgical nursing, quantitative and qualitative analysis and research methodology. And she is the director of the University of Victoria Center for Evidence-Informed Nursing and Healthcare, a JBI Center of Excellence. She also serves on the BSN Curriculum Committee and the PhD Curriculum Committee. And as a scholar and researcher, she has a strong research interest in improving access and quality health services. Her program of research leverages dissemination and implementation science with patient-centered lens to address factors that influence quality and safety of care and outcomes using both quantitative and qualitative methodologies. And she's worked in several investigator initiated studies and phase three, four clinical FDA trials with implantable devices. So recent projects have focused on metal hypersensitivity and racism as predictors of health outcomes. Her interest in metal hypersensitivity grew after she was involved in a clinical case of a patient with an extensive allergy who experienced stent restenosis. So you are just going to be a wealth of knowledge and I'm so excited to hear all the details of this amazing journey. Well, thank you so much, Sherry, for inviting me to be here. I'm excited to have this dialogue with you and your audience. Go back and tell us your first experience when you were exposed to metal allergy, I believe it was on a critical care floor. I was a staff nurse and I received a patient from the step down unit who had came into the hospital because they had a myocardial infarction. They had a stent placed, and then they were taken to the step-down unit for further monitoring. While on the step-down unit, the patient developed those classic symptoms of a heart attack again. So that crushing chest pain, the mm -hmm. diaphoresis, the nausea, all of those things. They did a stat ECG and found out that she was having another heart attack. So they rushed her back to the cath lab, 
to figure out what was going on with her and found that the stent that was placed was restenosed. So they and how long had this that, been? How it was the same been? hospitalization. She wasn't stented and sent home. It was within a few days of each other. Wow. So she was basically doing fine and all of a sudden developed this classic symptoms of heart attack again and then was taken to the cath lab. And at that point, the clinical team was a bit concerned about her. This is not a usual picture. So they sent her to the ICU, critical care, for closer monitoring. And I was the nurse that received her and was taking care of her. Okay. So you can restenose that quickly within a matter of days under the right circumstance. Obviously, this is what I experienced. So I would probably say yes. I think if you look at the literature, it would say that the way the stent are right now, there are polymer coated stents. And the reason we have polymer coated stents is to prevent some of these restenosis events. And that actually causes a later or very late restenosis event. But I think everybody's physiology is so different and everybody's immune system is so different. I can't say for a fact that this only happens 10, 20 years down the road because the person that sure. I experienced this with was a lot shorter time frame. Okay. Uh, so they that. took her back to the cath lab and what mm -hmm. happened from there? So then she came to our unit and went through the routine admission assessment, made sure everything was fine. There was no additional bleedings or anything like that. I checked her allergy extensively in the medical record, as well as asking her and all of those things. And then after I finished doing all of those assessments, I said, let me go get you all cleaned up because the doctors are going to come around on you shortly. And as I was walking out of the room to go get the supplies, she said, oh, by the way, can you get me the gown without the clips on the shoulder? You know, if you've been in a hospital setting or in a healthcare setting, that we have these gowns that have the metal clips, uh -huh. snaps, which makes it easier to undress. I've been a nurse for a while and people ask you for a really interesting request, but this is one I have never heard of before. So I asked her why, and I explained to her that with those snaps, uh, gown is a lot easier to deal with all the drips and the lines and the wires and everything that she had on. And I'm just curious, why does she not want it? And so she said, oh, I'm definitely allergic to metal. And I said, definitely allergic to metal. Tell me about that. So she proceeds to tell me this really long history of not being able to tolerate skin contact with metal. Wow. I would think that most nurses, first of all, kudos to you for asking her why most nurses would probably just say, okay, and not even think about it being busy going about their task. But not only did you stop and ask her, but then she gives you this long history. What's your next thought? My next thought, I was actually a doctoral student. I was working on my PhD at the time in cardiac care. So I was pretty up to date on the literature. And I remember reading several case studies, meta-analysis about patients with allergies to metal and the increased incidence of restenosis. That was the first thing that came to my mind. So I said to her, did you tell your doctors about this? And she looked at me, she said, nobody asked me. And so I was like, oh my gosh, oh my goodness, right? Because I know when I came in that morning, when I saw her that morning, I asked her about her allergies. In fact, she had no allergy band on her arm. I'm pretty certain my colleagues have all asked her about allergies. Or maybe we asked her, do you have drug allergies? In which case she would say, I have no allergy. And then we documented that in her chart and didn't put an arm band on her. So when she told me this, I was like, oh my goodness, you need an arm band and we need to be able to document that in your medical record. That was my first sinking feeling. And then after that, when the doctors came for round, when it got to nurses update, I said, do you know this patient had an extensive allergy to metal? The attending looked at me and said, what? <laughs> and I said, yeah, she just told me all of these things that she's allergic to. Curious, what is the stent? What kind of stent did we put in her? And what is that stent made out of? The attending jokingly said, why is it that we always find something obscure with your patients when you're working? And I'm like, because I, I talk to my patients. I like my patient. I like to chat with them. So he said, let's get the fellow, let's get the cardiology fellow on the phone to find out what kind of stent was put in, what kind of metal composition the stent has and go from there.
So that was my first exposure to this issue. Now, are all stents metal? All of They all have a metal base. It used to be that they were all bare metal, the first generation. And over time, they've been proved to the point where they're covered with polymers to protect it from the body. Those drug-eluting stents have improved the issues that the bare metal stents were having before. But if anything, it probably just delayed the incidence of some of these things that we're seeing with the stents. And by polymers, you mean a synthetic coating, maybe like a polyethylene or a peak material or something like that? Polymers are drugs that can be used to cover the stent so that it can protect the metal base of the stent. So the body is really not exposed to the actual metal. But what we do know is over time, that polymer, that drug does elute, meaning that it does absorb over time. And so when it does absorb, what you have is the bare metal stent over time. Okay. You left this patient at some point on this journey. Yeah. She came in, we rounded on her, did everything that we needed to. And I should actually mention that the initial hypothesis that the docs were thinking was that they thought this patient had a genetic polymorphism where they metabolize these drugs that we use. We use antiplatelet drugs really to protect the stent. And they thought that she might have one of those polymorphism. If you metabolize okay. the drug really quickly, there's not enough drug in the system to achieve that antiplatelet effect. I drew blood that morning looking for that exact thing. In terms of people getting stent restenosis, there is not necessarily a million, but there's a lot of reasons why that can happen. And the polymorphism is one reason. There can be other patient factors. Sometimes people who are diabetic, they have higher incidence of this happening. Sometimes, depending on the vessel and how the stent was deployed, all of that can play a role. So just to say that there's a lot of reasons why this could have happened, but metal, allergies to metal is also one of those reasons. And so for this particular patient, once we figure out that it wasn't anything that was really pressing that need a critical care, she got transferred back to the step-down unit. I wasn't actually able to find out what the outcome was after they talked to the cardiology fellows and what ended up being the outcome for her. So let me ask you, before we move on to the rest of your metal allergy endeavors, just before we leave the cardiac realm, if a patient with a known metal allergy has to have a stent, and is there anything besides the drug-eluting stent that can be done? Is there any other option? And what is that? This is one of the issues in this problem of metal hypersensitivity, in that clinicians need alternatives in order to not do the first choice, right? We've done some studies and we'll talk more about what those studies were, but one of the cardiologists that we interviewed basically said, what am I supposed to do when a patient is in front of me having acute coronary syndrome, right? Which is pending heart attack. What am I supposed to do? Do I not stand them because of this issue or not? And my clinical judgment would be that that conversation still needs to happen, right? So the patient before stents became a mainstream thing, we'd had open heart surgery, right? When you undergo open heart surgery, there are metal-based equipments that can be used as well. But getting out a wire versus trying to get a stent out of a vessel, those are very two challenging processes and one is more feasible than the other. So I think that having a conversation about, yes, I am allergic to metal needs to happen, but then the risk benefit ratio needs to be discussed and not weighed. If the person is stable enough, maybe they are one that can go for an open heart surgery. If the person is not stable enough, there are more bio-desorbable stents that are coming up on the market. I don't know that any of them is currently marketed. I think they're all in clinical testing at this point. So then that might become an option for that particular person. But the problem is we're not having the conversation. We're not asking patients whether they're allergic to it. 
If you're not asking it, you're not documenting that this problem actually exists to the magnitude that it exists and that there's no real incentive for the engineers to want to do something, to invent something differently to address the problem. I think we need to start having a conversation so that companies know that this is a pressing issue that needs to be addressed. If a stent is placed and a stent is a bioabsorbable, does that mean it dissolves at some point? Over time, yes, it would dissolve so, over time. It's almost like the suture, the dissolvable sutures that we have nowadays. You're talking to somebody that is just a lay person. So if I have a stent and the stent dissolves, does not the blood vessel close again? Does that procedure have to be reperformed? No. So that's the thing. The thought is that once the vessel is opened and kept yes. and the healing process happened, that you might not actually need the device in place forever. Right. Okay. Once the vessel is healed, there's revascularization and all of those things that happen then the stent can dissolve and it should, assuming you have the right medication, the right lifestyle changes and all of those things, then the vessel should be fine as long as they're engaging in the other modifiable behaviors. Is there such thing as like something as simple as a carbon fiber coated stent? I've heard that carbon fiber is pretty friendly to people with metal allergies. I think it was Linda Nelson who shared about a scoliosis patient who couldn't tolerate the titanium implant and they wound up making the spinal implants coated in carbon fiber and redid the surgery and the patient was able to tolerate just fine. It camouflaged the metal from the body. Are you aware of anything like that in the stent world at this point? Honestly, no, I'm not aware of that. I think a lot of the things are moving to biodissolvable, like pacemaker leads. How do you get something into place yes. to do the work that it needs to do and then over time leave the body? I think yeah. a lot of orthopedic surgeon, and I know you had Scott on here too, will say, can we use the devices to achieve the functional changes that we need? And then those de devices can then leave the body. That might mm -hmm. be the wave of the future. Oftentimes we put implantable devices into the body to achieve functional correction, but physiologically you can have decomposition after that, right? So yes. how do we make it so that you can achieve that functional correction that you want and then the device can leave the body in a short period of time so that it doesn't stay in the body for that immune dysregulation to happen. So I know I think for that me, might be the wave. Mm -hmm. yeah, for me, like I can't speak for another patient, but for me, I am so sensitive to metal internally that if I went to the hospital with a heart attack tomorrow, I'd probably tell them to let me die. I hate to say that, but I would be terrified to have any kind of stent. There's probably no way I could handle a pacemaker. I went through such hell personally with my own journey that people can hear in episode one and two of the podcast. I can't go back there. So I can't even imagine, you know, what bridges the gap between here and what you say needs to happen. I totally agree with you, but it needed to happen yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I think if we were to have an open and transparent conversation with all members of the healthcare team, I think that they could take a person with extensive allergy to metal through a cardiac procedure and safely. But we have to have the conversation. For example, if a patient can get blood for some reason, maybe they have a lot of antibodies or whatnot, they do surgeries on those people and they come out safely on the other end. It, it, it happened because there's this whole open discussion and then plans put in place for that person. So if a person presents to the hospital with a heart attack and we are having this conversation, then maybe talking to different companies to see what exactly are the options and availability of different things that may not be metal-based, that might be appropriate for this patient. If we have had those discussion, then when the situation presents itself, I think we can realistically get people through these sort of emergent situations, but we just have to be prepared. That's critical well, care it, 101, it, right? You want to be proactive yeah, well, and, and reactive. Yeah. And it starts with, you said that you had come across some of the metal hypersensitivity conundrums in your clinical research as you were going through your cardiology courses, was this something that you just found or was this 
metal hypersensitivity quotient part of the curriculum that you study? It was not. This is all part of me reading for my dissertation. So nobody has ever taught it, but I will say that once I knew, once I read, and once I experienced as a faculty teaching med surge classes for my nursing students, none of them can say that from that time forward, I didn't tell them that think, when you are assessing for allergy, you have to assess for metal as well. I think the problem is twofold. I think it's having patients that know you need to talk about any reactivity to metal with your healthcare providers. It needs to be in your chart. And you can't forget that, oh yeah, I used to have reactions to earrings all the time when I got my ears pierced. It's critical, vital information. That's the first thing. The second thing is you're an amazing nurse. I can tell you, Jifa, you're a diamond in the sea of a bunch of doctors that not only don't acknowledge that metal hypersensitivity is a thing, they don't acknowledge how big of a thing it is. So I think you got really lucky based on my personal experience and the experience of many metal allergic patients that I know. You got lucky to have the ear of doctors that would listen to you and act on your advice. Many doctors are out there gaslighting patients and saying, this isn't a thing. You can't react to titanium. You can't react to nickel and you can't have systemic delayed reactions, which we know this is a type four delayed hypersensitivity reaction. So the symptoms that show up post-op at week one, week two, aren't always the same as present in six months. I think those are the things that need to happen probably even first before we can get to the realization that we need better device options. Yes? You know what? I couldn't agree with you more, Sherry. And I have to say that as a clinician, I've been quite fortunate to work with amazing interdisciplinary group of people, whether they be physician, pharmacists, nurses, dietitian, whoever. Where I worked at the time, there was a concerted effort to inquiry, being curious and trying to push the button for a better outcome for the patient. There was that commitment. And I think what you're talking about, that whole gaslighting piece, I wasn't aware of it until much later as I started digging deeper and deeper into this. Then I started encountering it and it was horrifying. It was horrifying to me to think that you can show somebody published literature on something and show somebody about a person's story and they're like, oh, that is something rare that never happens. And you're like, what makes you think it's rare? Please define that for me. So the gaslighting piece is something that has become new knowledge to me as I started to unpack this issue. I agree with you. I always thought that once you had those initials behind your name, you're a PhD, you're an RN, you're an MD, you're a DO, that these credentialed individuals would get more respect when the peers are dealing with each other. And I have come to find out through talking with people like you and other credentialed professionals in the business, that's not the case. There are credentialed professionals that think the other credentialed professionals are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Sherry, I'll share with you that I've also had a personal walk on this journey and it is maddening to say that now, not only do I, and I'm not coming to you saying that I know everything about this, but I probably read a lot more than my average colleagues on the topic. And then presenting, I won't blame it all in the medical system, but a health professional with a family member with this issue and getting the exact resistance and pushback that some of your guests and other people may have talked about that nobody believed them that this is happening. It was horrifying. And I will also say that even my family, my own family, who know I talk about this ad nauseum, when this was happening to my son, many of them kind of rolled their eyes at me like, oh my gosh, Jifa, just because you're studying this doesn't mean this is happening to him. And I'm like, I really think it is actually happening to him. Can you share that journey? Yeah, absolutely. But just to say that there's a lot of denial on the patient perspective, the public perspective, and then in the larger health system. And with regards to my own personal journey on this, several years ago, my son has an underbite. And so they needed to expand his jaw, the top part of his jaw, so that the bottom can actually go back a bit. And I should say that he gave me consent to share his story. So we went to the dentist and got consult and all of those things. And then he had this device fixed 
to the upper part of his jaw that every night there was this uh, screw thing that I used to widen it over time. And so within about a week or so of him getting this, he started getting some blisters on his lips. The blisters were not painful. It wasn't like something that was liquid filled blisters. It just looked like he got burnt or something like this. And so okay. I thought, hmm, that was strange. And then a few days later, he woke up and he's like, mom, my tongue is very bumpy. I palpated his tongue and it did feel very rough. So I was like, hmm. So I called the orthodontic person and he said, yeah, sure. Come on in. And he assessed him and said, okay, you know what? Yep. His tongue is bumpy. He gave him some mouthwash. And to this day, I should have asked what the mouthwash was, but he's like, here's some mouthwash. Just get him to rinse two or three times a day and it should be fine. Okay. So did that and the tongue improved. But then what ended up happening is he started developing, I could only really call them burn. They're not rashes, but it was just burns. You'll wake up in the morning and you'll look at his arm and it's like somebody took a match and burned his skin. You see his skin and you see that, okay, there's burnt marks there. And then the top skin will slough off and it will just start bleeding. Mm. And it's like one of those slow bleeds that you can't stop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sit there with the pressure on it but it'll just keep bleeding 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 and so hmm, I'm like watching this I'm like this is really odd and then one day he came back from school with a pressure bandage on his arm and so I'm like oh what happened did you fall something happens like no mom you know that thing on my arm it just kept bleeding and bleeding and bleeding at school so I thought huh this is not normal there's something going on here so I took him to the nurse practitioner to get con consult and then I said, he has this thing in his mouth. I don't know if these things are connected. And they said, okay, let's do a dermatology consult. And so got sent to dermatology. Dermatology came back and said, there's probably some sort of eczema or something. Here's some steroids. And I was like, no, I think this is related to the thing in his mouth. Can we test it for it? I don't know why I thought this would be a simple thing. The dermatologist said, mm, nah, it's contact dermatitis. He'll be fine. Just use the steroid ointment as prescribed. This is when I started talking to family and talking to people like, no, I really think this is the dental. And no history of dermatology issues prior to well, this. Well, so he has okay. food allergies, okay. uh, but none no type of this kind of reaction before. And this was so how long after I, he had the expander placed? How long was it? This is like within a week to, it took okay. six, seven weeks to resolve, but it okay. was really immediate. It wasn't something that okay. we talked was about. Delayed. It wasn't like a year. This is like within a six, eight week period. I remember actually calling Scott about this. And I was like, Scott, am I going crazy? Like, what is wrong with me? I'm, I'm sending him pictures of these lesions and bleeding things. And then he asked me like, what is that metal thing made out of? And I'm like, Scott, I have no idea. So I went online trying to search and all of those things. And I'm like, I would really love for them to test them to see what is going on. So he's like, if I were you, I would try and get it out of him. It was interesting that I almost felt like I needed that validation to then finally go to the orthodontic guy to say, hey, can you consider that this might be an immune hypersensitivity reaction? And can we get this thing taken out of them? Because who wants to be that parent, right? You don't want to be that, <laughs> you know, all that patient for that matter, right? I don't mind standing up for my kid or for myself, but sometimes they can roll their eyes on you. It's just, oh, just defy again. And nobody wants that, right? So I go to the dentist and I said, look, I really think he's reacting to this. Can we take it out? And he's like, you know, I've seen nickel allergy before. His gum line doesn't look like that and all of these things. And I said, how much nickel do you think is in this thing? And he's like, yeah, maybe 10, 11%. And I'm like, even 1% can cause somebody a problem, right? And uh, I think this was Scott's favorite line or somebody said it, that if your patient or if your child was allergic to nuts, would you give them a little bit of nuts? <laughs> and the answer is no, yes. you wouldn't you would avoid it, right? Unless it's some sort of therapy you're going through, but if you're allergic to nickel, whether it's 1% versus 12% or 11%, you want to avoid it. You're going to react to it. So after a few visits and discussion back and forth with the dentist team, they decided to take it out. 
they said the correction's not finished and I said I don't care we'll figure that out after the fact let's just take this thing out of his mouth he did took it out all the rashes disappeared the lips the tongue the arms everything disappeared so I'm like it wasn't cuckoo for cocoa paw this was yeah. real so, re- so, so you're going to the source instead of playing whack-a-mole with all the symptoms exactly and again, doctors don't exactly. realize that this rash can show up removed. If you're allergic to nickel or other metals, the rash and the symptoms can show up removed from the site of the metal. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Through the research work, people have complained about sometimes the legs, sometimes even the face, even though maybe they have a spinal implant or something, it's not mm-hmm. on the face or oftentimes with the dental, they would talk about worsening case of acne and those kind of things. But Mm -hmm. often the symptoms do appear removed from where the implant is. So it doesn't come to mind when that person is complaining of the problems. Right. And now a word from our sponsor. Attention metalheads, are you struggling with skin rashes, joint and systemic pain, or fatigue that just won't go away? Type 4 metal allergy is often overlooked as a culprit in many of today's chronic illnesses. Get to the root of the problem with MELISA testing. MELISA is a scientifically proven and clinically validated test that measures immune reactivity to metal allergens like nickel, cobalt, and titanium. With fast and reliable results, you can get the answers you need to find relief and live a healthier life. Don't let metal allergies control your life any longer. Visit MELISA.org to learn more and schedule your test. Trust us, you'll be glad you did. MELISA a valuable diagnostic tool in medicine. Just to tell the listeners, when she's talking about Scott, she's talking about Dr. Scott Schroeder, who was a guest on episode six. We're all on a first name basis, but he's got a fascinating episode. If you haven't heard it, go listen to episode six for all the surgery stories. This is who Jifa is referring to. And Jifa, I'll tell you a funny story real quick. My son is 21 now. He likes to blacksmith and he likes to play with metal. From time to time when he's hammering and doing all the blacksmith things, he'll get pieces of metal stuck in his skin. This is before we knew he had a metal allergy. He wound up due to the metal allergy, having a whole bunch of systemic symptoms and issues. When he got Lyme disease, like I did, because the immune system is overreacting, he had the scar on his hand that had been healed for years, like two years. And when he caught Lyme mm-hmm. disease, that scar boiled up into this big, huge boil that opened and oozed. And we had to go to the doctor and we were like, you know, the weirdest thing is this is a scar from something that has been healed for years. And now mm. all of a sudden it's erupting. We wouldn't find out that he had a nickel allergy for years after that. But once we found out, we're like, that's why the scar erupted two years later, because there was metal inside the scar. Oh, my gosh. Is that oh crazy? Gosh. It's nobody... amazing. <sighs> so, nobody so had get... ever made those connections either, right? Right. I have got a really good PA that was handling it at the time and she's open to all the things. I went back and told her, she's like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Your mind mm-hmm. always has to be turning to make some of these connections. I get rashes on my leg. I don't have any hardware on my leg. I used to get the petechiae for people yeah. who don't know what that is. It's a little rash. It looks like little pinpoints of blood vessels all over your arm. I had petechiae. I had just really strange. And the rashes always usually bleed. Like you said, they ooze or they bleed. There's a particular place I get a rash when I eat foods that are high in nickel and it bleeds and it's in the strangest place. And I never knew what it was until I realized that there was nickel in the diet. And when I was eating something high in nickel is when that would always break out. Crazy. Yeah, it is really amazing the way the body reacts to the environment and things that we're putting into it. And maybe when I was younger, I might not have bought into a lot of these things, but I'm a converted person now that <laughs> everything we're, where we're living, what we're putting in our mouth and all of those things. They, they used to say, if you could see where your food comes from, you wouldn't eat it. That's probably yeah. true in a lot of respects. <laughs> I don't want to know. Okay. So <laughs> resolve this with your son and you go back to the doctor do you get yes. validation at that point from the doctors? You know what, to be honest, no, not, not really. I remember saying, hey, there's a lot of research around this area. In fact, I was like, hey, I'm doing some research myself in this area. If you want to collaborate and look at this, let me know. But they, they told me that they weren't convinced that this is a, such a huge problem. 
Like it's not something they see very commonly in their practice. How can you not so, be convinced when you take it out and everything goes away? <laughs> Isn't that enough? No. The other part too that I will say is there's a lack of documentation around this. I would love to actually retrieve my son's medical record to see what, if anything, about this was documented. I'm sure something was documented, but whether the notion that the device came out, he got better, whether that was captured in the medical record, because that's the other gaping gap in the healthcare system yes. that we've noted in that people have these experiences Devices come out, think their symptoms come out, but it's never actually documented and it doesn't follow them through. Yes. And one of the next episodes, probably the episode to follow this one is going to be an episode on adverse event reporting because it is so crazy important. I haven't done my own and it needs to be done because I'm a slam dunk case. And there's probably a thousand people or more out there just like me who just don't know where to start to report their adverse yeah. event. So we're going to cover that in this podcast really soon. That's amazing. And I have to just say, Sherry, I really liked what you like what you're doing in terms of taking people through the process. We have the episode around even the blood testing, right? It was great to see Linda talk about the background and then you say, okay, let me take you through the step by step. This is what you do. This is how you're going to do it. I think Can that's I tell very you important. Thank you. Yes, Can I tell please. you what a hard video that was to edit? I've never done anything like that. I had no idea what I was doing. I just filmed a thousand videos and I'm like, well, I'm just going to piece them all together. And man, that was some crazy stuff. Oh my gosh. So imagine not feeling well, and you know this, you're not yes. feeling the best. And then you have to figure out these step-by-step -step things and the blood is going across the world. You don't want to mess it up. You don't want to go through all of that for them to say, sorry, we couldn't analyze it. I think it's great that you're doing really. Well, thank you. It, you're so right though. There was a time, Jifa, you didn't know me then. I couldn't sit. I couldn't stand. I couldn't walk five feet. I could walk to the bathroom and back to the bed. That was it for years. So having to take somebody that's that critical, and when you're that critical, you need answers. I was measuring my steps. There were probably days where I could take, I don't know, a hundred steps in the whole day. So if 50 of those steps are walking into FedEx and walking into the lab and back, you got to know what you're doing because your time is limited on your feet. And I get that. And that's my passion is to serve that community. The system doesn't actually know this. So you can't even go to your lab and expect them to tell you. They don't know. You're actually teaching them how to do some of these things yourself. And if nobody walked you through a process, how are you going to walk anybody through a process? I'm just really glad that you exist and your podcast exists so that people can actually have some resources to help them do the step-by-step. -step. I would love for you to do one around how do you have a conversation with your healthcare provider around this oh, yes. issue? Because I think patients legitimately, you know, there's that whole power dynamic. So how do I bring up the topic and how do we make sure that they don't shut you down? Okay, you opened this can of worms, Jifa. So here's the thing. I am totally willing to do that episode. Will you come do it with me? You're a provider. Yes, will will you help me with that yes. episode? I yes, will be I'm back. I will be back so we can so have in. this dialogue with people. Oh, Absolutely. let's do that really soon. And what better advice could we get than from you as a credential professional to tell us, I know what's worked for me, but I'm a little like kind of balls to the wall. I'm super vocal about things, but there are ways to approach doctors. If you overwhelm them with all the symptoms and the story, they can't focus on the fact and what you're really there to achieve. Okay, here so. you. Yeah, they can hear you. Yeah. Exactly. We'll definitely do that super soon. Maybe next week. I was going to um, say, you know, your balls to the wall, not ovaries to the walls there, Sherry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I got no ovaries and I got no balls. So <laughs> uh, breasts to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> breasts to the wall. There you go. Memory, to the wall. memory glands to the wall. <laughs> oh, gee. Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, thank you for pointing that out. Okay. So where do we go from here? So your son is now better and you have moved on. Yes. It probably fueled your desire to do more research into metal allergies. So yes. let's go back and tell us how this translated into your professional pursuits. Okay. Thank you for that. So initially after seeing that patient in the ICU, I started just talking to my colleagues around, do you know this happened? Do you ask your patients about this? I have amazing colleagues. So they'd never seen it, but they were curious. Like, huh, really? 
So I would share the publications with them. And they're like, hmm, I didn't really know that this happened. But yes, I will start asking now. But then I also noted that there were also a handful of people that when I would speak to them about this, they literally thought I was drinking some sort of Kool-Aid. You're drinking some Kool-Aid. Like, where is this really document? Is this real? And so yeah. I thought to myself, initially, I thought this is a simple quality improvement project where we just do a whole system-wide education about metal and then get our teams to ask about metal at the various points during the care journey. Mm -mm. It wasn't a simple QI thing because even trying to convince the health system that to do this QI thing was a battle. And so I was fighting that battle and I kept thinking, why is this so hard? Why is this so difficult? We ask about metal and we send our patients for MRI. We ask about latex and all of these different things. Why is it such a hard change to add metal to the list of questions? that we already had. So I was fighting that battle. The institution that I was going through to get clearance to do this just wasn't having it. They were putting me through the ringer. And then I went to a conference on evidence implementation and dissemination and met a lady there. I presented this issue and she, after the conference, said, let's chat. So then she started giving me some ideas in terms of how I could start gathering data to show that the healthcare providers don't know. And so ultimately what I ended up doing is turning the institution-based study into a web-based study where we survey people here in Canada, here in the U.S., Europe, and other places, healthcare providers, just to just get some basic numbers about who do you know that this happened do you do it? And if not, what will make you do it? Because to get evidence into practice, there are enabling factors and those barriers that people face. So we did the survey and found out that majority of the people that we surveyed, 90% of them had zero clue that people can react to metal and have a bad outcomes because of it. Now, these zero. are professionals in the credential professionals in the industry. This is healthcare professional, nurses, doctors, okay. cardiologists, pharmacists, students. So then the study of the survey also asked them, here's the information. Here's our two questions. Will you now start asking these questions and screening for metal hyper hypersensitivity? And 80% of them said, yeah, I'll start yesterday. Like, great. But then there's that 20% that basically said things like, no, they wouldn't do it. And then we asked them, why wouldn't you do it? Some of them say they don't believe in the science, in the evidence at the current. Others talk about the futility of screening, and that's what we quote it as. And what they mean by it is that I don't have anything else to do for my patient. And because I don't have anything to do for my patient, it's futile to screen. I yeah. see. We don't have the alternative device or we don't have an alternative procedure. So it doesn't matter if they're going to react or not. We just move right, on. Right? And once they leave the OR and once they leave our facility, it's not our problem. We, we see them in post-op, so, they're doing great. How can these providers know if you come to post-op visit at two weeks and four weeks and then you're discharged? How do they know what happens to you in six months? They don't know. It's interesting that you bring this up because I go to church with somebody that runs a surgery center and I asked her, could you simply just implement into your screening process? Have you ever reacted to metal? And she said, I don't think we can. I don't think there's any value in that. She's the director of the facility. And something else, I will tell you the flip side of that is that I went to a surgical center with my husband who had a surgical procedure with a surgeon who's actually coming on the podcast. But in that screening, they did say, have you ever reacted to metal or jewelry? Do you have hy metal hypersensitivity? Jifa, I came off the table. I stood up and I was like, yes. <laughs> oh, no, no. Like for real, <laughs> my reaction was that strong. And I literally about fell over the first time I've been in a lot of facilities. I've had 30 plus surgeries. It's the first time I've ever been asked or we've ever been asked one time. Exactly. That was an eye-opening moment though for me, Sherry, when I was in this journey in that I was puzzled by that particular statement about the futility. So 
at that point, I had know somebody who had issues with the metal allergy. So I started just having a conversation with them. I finished the study and he said some of the things that I'm seeing and it just doesn't settle well with me. What do you think from a patient perspective? And this person was also a researcher. So I'm like, from a patient perspective, though, what do you say to that when healthcare providers are saying this futility of screening? Because I still think it needs to be screened. So they said, look, it's not about futility. It's about informed consent. And I was just like, wow, right? She said, look, whether or not there's alternative, it's my body and I have a right to know and to make that decision, right? That what you're about to put in my body, my body could potentially react to it. And I need to know that I need to be 100% informed about it. And so then I said to them, this is why we did the research that we've done, is that if you look at all of the literature that we have on this topic, it's never been from the patient perspective. Because what do we know? Case study. <laughs> this is your right. body. You live in it 24-7. Right. What would you know about right. it? Sarcasm, by the way, for those who didn't oh, yeah. pick up on it. <laughs> Even if you have a case report and a case study, is your health team that is reliving that story. It's not you telling your story. And so at that point, I said to this person, would you join forces with me for us to do a study? But from a patient perspective, I want to hear your story. I want to know what happened from before you had the implant. I want to know what was discussed during the consenting period and how that shaped your experience. So we did that study and I was even more enraged and set on fire, just like this issue really needs to be addressed. And the reason why I say that is every single person I spoke to had a heart-wrenching account of what it was to have these devices in their body and yes. then not be believed that this is happening to them. Some of were prescribed antibiotics thinking that it was infection, which it wasn't an infection. Some were put on antipsychotic medication. Others had opioid thrown at them because they were having relenting pain without anybody sitting back and say, wait a minute, you might actually be responding or reacting to the metal. Even when they show up to the healthcare provider's office with a litany of documentation of what was happening to them, and some of them even showed up with published articles about this particular phenomenon, they were still told it's not happening. Yeah. And let me just qualify that with when I was super sick, I personally knew I had every piece of evidence that I was suffering with an allergy to metal. My brother is a chiropractor and wanted me to go see another professional. And so out of courtesy to him, I did that. By all appearances, this should have been a fantastic visit. This is a board certified internal medicine doctor who was fellowship trained in allergy, immunology, and rheumatology. And I take all my course to her with the evidence. I take the requisition for an orthopedic analysis LTT blood test with peer-reviewed scientific articles that validate the test. And I go to her, I lay out all the symptoms and I had them all. On the symptom list of like 50 symptoms, I had all but five. And she said to me, I don't know what your problem is. You're just going to have to live with it. You don't exhibit any symptoms or signs of metal allergy. And I'll sign off on this requisition for the test just because you drove all this way. That was what I got. I'm a very strong person. So thankfully I didn't listen to her, but probably I would guess eight out of 10 patients would have listened to her. Here's a doctor with all these degrees in all these areas of patient focuses that are directly involved and correlate with the subject matter. And they're telling me that it's not an option and it's not a thing. Thank God I didn't listen to her or I probably would not be here today. I would be dead. And the thing is, I needed to go back to what you said earlier, informed consent. I needed every surgery I had. I've had a lot of orthopedic surgeries. I needed them all. I wasn't searching after surgery. I needed them. And I experienced benefit from every single one. I would have had every single one that I had, most likely, except for maybe the cholecystectomy. But if somebody would have said at the beginning, we're asking you about your metal hypersensitivity exposure. We don't believe that you will react. 
but there is always a chance that you could experience reactions removed from the surgery that correlate. And if you do, here's a list of resources. Here's a list of things we can test. And here's a list of things you can explore. And we have revision options if needed. I still would have gone forward with the surgery, but it could have saved me years of suicidal pain. Yeah. And how many people don't get that lucky? Yeah. Lucky and privilege is the thing that I also want the listeners to know is that Sherry, I don't know whether you think of yourself as being privileged, but you have the ability to be able to do these searches, to go talk to people that are in positions of power to be able to help you galvanize the energy and the strength to go and advocate for yourself. Think about the number of people who don't have that, who don't have the savviness to be able to even read some of these papers. Who or the supportive spouse these, or the transportation or, the, spouse. or exactly. the, I got so lucky and I choose to believe that I got lucky. So I could be a voice for the unlucky, right? I got very Absolutely. lucky. Absolutely. We've talked about this. I got my gallbladder clips out immediately. I got my hardware out immediately from three different surgeons and people are not that lucky. I thought that people taking out hardware and taking out clips was routine. And this is just common sense. It's not. And I got very it's lucky. Not. So it's just emboldened and impassioned me to be a voice for the voiceless here because I, I live and, and I, because yeah. of that blessing. I couldn't agree more. And you say luck. I think yeah. it's a privilege for us, you and I both to be sitting here with the information to be able to then advocate on behalf of everyone else, because the evidence is there, it's clear as day, right? So we should be doing the right thing. And if we don't give the voice to the voiceless, then they're going to continue to suffer in silence. And that's just not, it's it's not not just suffering. It's It's lives are in danger and lives are being lost every day. Lives are being lost to this. People are giving up and not having hope. And there absolutely is hope. There's recovery. Look at me. I couldn't walk five feet. Now I can walk all day long. I can sit. I can stand. If I wouldn't have persevered, I wouldn't be here to tell this story. I'll just take a minute and pause and tell people listening. Your story is very important. You need to be here and we need you as part of this movement. So if you're thinking of giving up, don't do it. You got all kinds of hope, all kinds of faith. Please And we are behind you. (laughs) Yes, please don't. The amazing supports that you have in social media, that is great. There's also people who genuinely, physicians and surgeons, they are there. It's hard to find them. I'm not going to lie, but they are there and they were willing to support. And I think the other piece that we need to start looking into, I'm a nurse, I'm a problem solver. I don't like having problems. I just want to solve them, everybody's problems. (laughs) But if we don't hear the stories, we're not going to be able to find means to to solve them all. So we know that when you have devices taken out, which one of the orthopedic surgeons that I spoke to said to me, he's like, there's no guarantee your patient's ever going to recover when they have the device taken out. And I said, you're right. In the study that we've done, there are like three outcomes really out there. You have an implant, you're reacting to it, they take it out and your symptoms are gone. You're back to where it was before and you go on to live a full life. There are also a group of people who have the device taken out and even though they have improved from where they were, they've never come back to the way they were before the device went in. Mm -hmm. So they continue to have these immune issues autoimmune issues that nobody really can put their fingers on it, but at least they're not bedridden. At least they're not Mm -hmm. as bad as they was with the device. Yes. And then there are a group of people because of the risks associated with taking out the device, they can't have the device taken out. But at least knowing that somebody Mm -hmm. can validate and say that you're not crazy. This is not in your mind that your body is literally reacting I know for people that I've interviewed who initially when we get into the conversation, there's a lot of anger. And so there should be. But at the end of it, all of them have said, you know what? I just want my story to be heard so we can do the right thing moving forward. Even if you can't you know- take out the implant in my body, at least know that this happened. And so for the next patient, you can take their situation or they could be handled differently. 
I have to interject this real quick, just because this is the perfect spot to bring this up. But the work that you're doing, Jeefa, is important. I, I think that I'm a voice and I'm helping to contribute. But I got a letter two days ago and it really touched me. I'm just going to read you a couple of sentences here. She just said, I don't know where else to go. My future daughter-in-law saw your post on Instagram and sent it straight to me. I cried because I didn't feel alone anymore. Oh, yeah. That's the power of this. And I will also say as a researcher, as a nurse, when I started in this space, I just didn't understand. I didn't know the isolation and the vulnerability that people were experiencing. And now that I know, I could not see myself well, doing and- anything other than this. Yes. And you know, there's so much PTSD that comes from going through something like this. We will be having very, very soon an entire episode that is only dedicated to mental health, nurturing Mm -hmm. yourself and overcoming the PTSD from going through a traumatic health experience. That's coming Mm -hmm. too, because it's as important as getting physically better. We have to get mentally better to move past. Oh, it's very, very important. It's very important. Absolutely. Thank you. So tell us about some of your clinical trials. You're doing some studies. Can you talk about those? Talk about what you have done and talk about what you are doing. And if there's anything that that listeners could participate in that you want to solicit for, you're welcome to do that too. Oh, thank you so much. So yes, other things that we've done other than quantifying the healthcare workers' knowledge or professionals' knowledge about the issue, we've also done the study where we spoke to people who have had the issue and had the device either taken out or not. Those two papers, one of them was just recently published. So you can have that, make that available to your readers or your audience. And the second paper is still under review, which basically talked about what the patient's perspective and experiences are before surgery, during surgery, and then after the device implant. I will tell you that all the work that we're doing not to took my own horn, but our team is the first to be doing these things. We're not the first to document the metal hypersensitivity exists, but we are the first to give you the patient's story. So all the things that patients were saying was that we want the health system to believe us. We want to be informed, just like what you said, Sherry, earlier, that We know that we needed the surgery. None of them are denying that they needed surgery. They know Mm -hmm. they need the surgery. All they want is for you to say this and this and this can happen. The same way we tell when we discharge patients. As a nurse, I will say, hey, keep an eye on that incision site. If it's red, if it's draining, if you get a fever, if you get any of these things, go here. That's exactly the same thing. They want you to tell them that your body can react to the device. And when it does, this is some of the ways that it might present. Yeah, and here's a list of foods not to eat. eat if you react to the yeah. device. So here's this list of high histamine and high nickel foods. Try taking these out and see if it makes a difference in your pain and your symptoms. Yeah, exactly. It's not rocket science per se. So that paper is under review. Fingers crossed that it gets full accepted and we'll make that available to you. That study also then set the stage for another current study that we're doing, which is patients in the previous study talked about just the difficulty that they encountered trying to get tested. The difficulty is multifaceted. Linda talked about the testing, so I'm not going to do that. That's her expertise. But in terms of tracking information in the health system, people talked about how the person that put in the device, the clinic got closed. They weren't able to track down the health records. They have no real idea, the maker and manufacturer, the composition of the implant in their body. So we know that information needs to be captured and registered somewhere. Mm -hmm. We also know that when the device comes out of the body, they haven't actually been sort of this triangulation of all the patient symptoms, the blood work, the composition of the device, right? I sometimes we can say that everything else in this world is better regulated than (laughs) than a device in your body. (laughs) Than a device in your body, right? Wonderful. Wonderful. So beyond that, where do you see yourself going and where do you see the trends in the industry? Or is there anything to talk about here at this point? My focus is really on the clinicians and the, the and the patients. I'm trying to find ways to improve our dynamics because I think 
we nurses and the healthcare providers are going to be the patient's strongest advocates. So that's what my focus is. The next big project that I'm going to tackle is trying to create a registry for implantable devices. Oh when gosh. you, I know, right? So you don't have big goals or anything, do you there, Chief? <laughs> Not at all. Wow. It's a small, How much goal. would that no, serve but, the but community? But think about it, wow. right? So mm-hmm. when you go in for surgery, the registry would really want to walk people through from beginning to whatever outcome is. So you're on a wait list. And in Canada, we have wait lists for surgery. So you're on a wait list for surgery that involves implantable devices. I want to be able to bring people in at that point, obviously consent them because it's going to be health record, sure. capture the health outcome at where they are then, and then offer them testing. Right now, I'm doing some work with some ministry government people to try and see what would be the cost effectiveness of testing people before implant certain people, not everybody, and then seeing what the cost benefit is for the static, keeping things as they are currently. So I didn't talk about it, but that's another study that we're doing where we have taken data from our publicly available health system on people who have had implant, and we're trying to cost out their health journey with the medical device, with the implantable devices. And so then we're going to take that number and compare it to what would the government save if they offer people a $500 Melisa test or whatever the equivalent is in sure. the different countries. Yeah. And then see if we can change systems by looking at cost as well. well so that, and if it's that done, is also if it, study that's good. If it's done in bulk, does the test have to be $500? I think the cost goes down, right? If you're doing a volume probably the net cost wouldn't be anywhere near that. If this was implemented on a regular basis and labs had better funding, they could probably lower their profit margin a little bit based on volume to provide a test. I'm not going to say they're unreasonable, but they are expensive to provide a test at a lesser amount. Yeah, I think those are obviously conversation. I know Linda mentioned this, that we're hoping to open a lab here in Canada for Melissa. And there are conversations around, is there ways that the Melisa test, which is optimized, but is there other ways that we could detect this metal hypersensitivity without that sort of- Give a patient a handful of cashews a day before surgery and see how they are when they come in. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) That's really cheap. Here, have this complimentary (laughs) package of nuts. (laughs) Tell us how you feel tomorrow. (laughs) So you don't have anaphylaxis. No, you want this. So if they have it come in the next day and I got all this pain and I broke out in this rash and I don't know, but I'm just not feeling well. It's like, so thank you for telling us what you need to know. You have to go home now. (laughs) You can't have this surgery. (laughs) That's a really easy test. We'll just hand out nuts to the nutty patients. I have a question about your device registry Mm -hmm. plan. Would there also be interest in having the different devices available registered from the healthcare side as to chemical composition of the device. So not only is there a patient registry for implanted devices, but now there's a device registry for material compositions as well. This registry idea is what the ideal situation would be for implantable devices, which is that we are tracking the device compositions as well as who's getting it. And then also when people get it, they will get regular surveillance to say, how are you feeling today? Is anything different, right? Because sometimes there are subtle changes that they themselves are noticing. We need a health care provider who is trained and specializing in this particular issue. We need a subspecialty because if you think about organ transplantation, that's not something Mm -hmm. that every healthcare worker is knowledgeable on, but there's a special team of people. I believe we need a special team of those same similar analogous people on implantable medical devices. And that's the only way I think that we're going to be able to gather this big data to be able to then push and hopefully change the the systems around implantable devices. I do want to tell the listeners that I don't think that we're going to eradicate and eliminate the use of implantable devices on the planet. I don't think we will. I think we need them in the health system. We just need to have a tighter control. Like you and I will never accept blood without being tested for our blood type, without getting the donor blood tested and all of those things. 
But right now, you are asking me, you and everybody to get these devices put in my body with no testing. And what planet is that normal? It's not. Not in mm -hmm. 2023. We have enough knowledge. We will have a panel on device manufacturing and the device doesn't have to have this long study. The device just has to prove it's similar enough to another device on the market. Then it can go to the market without research or without study. Or then you have the company, the doctor signing off on whatever study, and he's funded by the device manufacturer. It's happening all the time. And that's the equivalent of big pharma. That's big medicine, right? It's. I know that when I started this work and started recruiting people, that was one really big concern for people that I was talking to. They wanted to know who's funding me, who put you up to this. And I'll tell your listeners right now is nobody's funding me. Clearly, nobody's funding me. This is my research program. I try to find money from different sources. And yes, I've used a startup fund from the university, from my own startup fund to fund. That's what actually I've used to fund. I've paid out of pocket mm. for some of these things mm. as well. But the reason why I do it is that I do believe that there are gaps in our systems that need to be fixed. I believe that with my whole heart. And hopefully the government and all the funding agency will one day see that, yes, there is a value for the research work that my team and others are doing, and then they want to fund it. To date, we haven't received any external funding for the work that we're doing. It's all been internal bootstrapping work. I think that Big Pharma, all of those folks, you know, they all have their own agenda, but I yes. th I'm hoping that there is an opportunity for all of us to come together and say that we want these devices to work. They want us to use the device. We want to use the device. But how do we create safe systems to support the use of that device? Oh my gosh, device? So, so perfectly said, Jifa. Thanks. <laughs> so perfectly said. The only other thing I would say that the work that we have done is really looking at what was done before as well. And so just recognizing that this issue have been around since the 1930s. We are writing a paper currently on the literature review that we conducted and just looking at case reports and everything that has been published since the 1930s. So that should hopefully be coming out as well, too. And I think overall, me as a researcher want to hear from people that are living it and looking at some of the therapies, anecdotal things that you're doing to try and maintain and control those symptoms. I think that is something else that we need to look at in a systematic way, not to say that I don't believe that it works for you, but just to say that, you know, we can study it and say to the non-converted, this went on board, these are the changes and whatever markers so that they have that quote unquote hard evidence. If the patient words is not enough that they can use to then guide their healthcare decision-making. So that's the thing that we're doing and just keep posted on this podcast. I'm sure when there's other things to share, I'll be in touch with you, Sherry, and then you can share with your listeners. For people tuning in that don't know, if you go to heavilymetaled.com, make sure you spell metaled with two L's, heavilymetaled.com. Every episode has its own page and every guest on the podcast has their own page. So Jifa will have her own page on heavilymetal.com. Her contact information will be there. There will be a comprehensive list of show notes, any photographs or images that are relevant, any papers that, such as she offered that are relevant. We have a whole list in the top menu of resources. Now we are getting ready to move websites, but heavilymetal.com will still be the address. The layout just may be a little different, but there's a whole bunch of podcast episodes podcast guests and resources on that page. So that is your one-stop shop for that. And Jifa, I don't know if you know this, but I'm going to announce to the listeners because this is something new. We are starting to collect anonymous patient testimonials of your experience with metal allergies for a page on the website. So people who don't have time or are uncomfortable appearing on camera can submit their story in writing, their patient story, and we will put it as an anonymous testimonial and story on the podcast page. So we can have a repository for more than just people that are willing to appear on camera. So there is that we have all the things. So Jifa in closing, I did forget to ask you a very important question and you probably know this is coming. You cannot come on the heavily metal podcast 
without saying what your favorite heavy metal band is and your favorite heavy metal song. I had a question for you because I actually don't okay. know the difference between heavy metal, rock and roll, and rock. Are those three different things or are they interchangeable? I guess I should probably start saying 80s metal, right? The quick music lesson is rock and roll would be your pop rock, what's called crossover material, music that crosses into the rock sphere, into the country sphere. And there's a lot of that now. There's classic rock, which is back in the 70s. There's 80s rock, which is where I come from, traditionally known as the hair metal stage, where the girls were girls and the boys were too. And then there was the 90s grunge metal rock. And I think it really is all encompassing. When I refer to heavy metal, I probably refer to more of the 80s metal hair bands, the iconics like Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith. So I will have to say the final countdown by Europe. It's the final countdown. Yep. That is an awesome <laughs> song. We hear it in every high school, every football game, on national TV. They really got a lot of mileage out of that song Europe did. I wonder what they're doing now. We'll have to know. I'll report back to the podcast. Yeah, good question. I haven't heard we from Europe in a to. long time. We should go well, Google them. We should. We'll go Google them and we will report back. On on the next episode, we will report back when Jifa comes back to talk about talking to your doctor <laughs> about metal allergies. I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> close this out. Say thank you again, Jifa, for a wealth of knowledge and for letting us into what's gone before, what's coming next and all the things. And definitely remind you to check out the website. Please sign up for the email list on heavilymetal.com. If you sign up for the email list, you're going to get a cool freebie. We've got some really cool things coming out really soon to announce and looking forward to having you all back for our next episode. And until then, Jifa and I are throwing it out to the medical industry saying, we're not going to take it anymore. Thank you for tuning in today. Please don't forget to follow me on social media and to like, share, share and subscribe. My primary mission is reaching out to others who may be suffering from hypersensitivity reactions to metal implants and pointing them to resources that can assist with hope, help, and healing. If you know someone that suffers from a chronic illness, you might ask if they have any implanted metal hardware and if they've ever had a reaction to jewelry or metals of any kind. Might not even be on their radar, Visit us at heavilymetal.com where you can find images and documentation relating to our show today, as well as a number of valuable resources and links to assist you on your own personal healing journey. Until next time, keep on rocking.